I'm Ian Mitchell. I'm an emergency physician in Kamloops, British Columbia at the Royal Inland Hospital. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of British Columbia. And locally, I'm a clinician at the CanSolve Clinic. Today I'm going to be talking of a tale of two drugs. Those drugs are THC and gabapentin. I'm going to be talking about their history, how they've been used, their research basis, and why physicians feel that those two drugs are so very different and should be treated so different. I'd like to begin with some history. And the history of cannabis begins millennia ago. Cannabis is one of the oldest domesticated plants in the world, going back its use into ancient China and Egypt. In the Western world, we found out about cannabis through India, where physicians brought back cannabis to be used in North America, where it was used for over a hundred years by some of the best known physicians in the English world, including Sir William Osler, who believed that cannabis was the best treatment available for migraines. At that time, Canadian drug companies fought amongst each other over who provided the best quality cannabis to Canadian physicians and patients. Cannabis was criminalized in 1923 in Canada for reasons that are still unclear. The history of gabapentin is much more modern. Gabapentin was invented in 1974 by a drug company called Park Davis. Park Davis, as well as distributing cocaine and cannabis, also invented PCP, ketamine, and gabapentin, really the party people of drug companies. Gabapentin was approved for sale in 1993 for the treatment of seizure disorders. When we look at the mechanism behind these two drugs, cannabis affects the endocannabinoid system. We all have a system within our body that responds to cannabis and also responds to chemicals within our body that are similar to cannabis. These chemicals, called endocannabinoids, help to regulate our mood, our sleep, and our appetite. On the other hand, gabapentin works on a different system. It was initially designed to work on GABA receptors. However, later research shows it actually affects calcium channels on nerve terminals. Looking at the research base of these two therapies, we find that the research that's been done on cannabis is overwhelmingly looking at harms. Over 90% of the research money that was ever spent was focused on looking at the harms of cannabis. Very little was spent looking at benefits. Part of the difficulty in studying cannabis is there is no supply of research cannabis in America to look at the benefits. The government will give you as much cannabis as you want to study the harms, but if you're looking to study the benefits of cannabis, you are not allowed to have any. That's recently been reversed. However, the cannabis that the government has been sending to researchers has been of low quality and containing mold and has been unable to be used in research studies. Canada is not much different. In Canada, red tape and hurdles mean that it is more difficult to study cannabis in Canada than it is to study heroin. Turning back to gabapentin, we can look at the research in gabapentin as being part of a criminal enterprise. And that really focused on a physician called Dr. Scott Rubin, who was incarcerated for falsifying data in research studies. He played a big part in the researching of gabapentin and its uptake by physicians. Pfizer, the drug company marketing gabapentin, realized that there was little money to be made in just the seizure management aspect of gabapentin. So they sent salespeople out to doctor's offices to convince them to use it for many other conditions in populations that had never been approved for, children, old people. As a result, Gap had a huge uptake among physicians, but ultimately Pfizer had to pay out the largest consumer fine in history, $430 million for their fraudulent mismarketing activities. We find that this pattern continues, however, with industry paid physicians still being much more likely to prescribe gabapentin. Looking at what effects these medications have on people, both gabapentin and cannabis, they have a similar side effect profile. Their side effects include dizziness, sedation, coordination problems, cognitive impairment. People are often very much more concerned about the mental health aspects of cannabis and how there are some adverse effects associated in that way, particularly with schizophrenia. What we understand is there is an association with cannabis and schizophrenia. If people start using cannabis at a very young age, 
and they are prone to getting schizophrenia, their symptoms may come out earlier and be more severe. But it does not appear that cannabis by itself can make someone schizophrenic. It can only affect people who are already vulnerable to this condition. There's also the myth of the amotivational syndrome. This is an idea that stoners sit around all the time and are very lazy and that just hasn't been borne out by research. Turning back to gabapentin, we find that we have new concerns about mental health and gabapentin from recent research. We know that it increases suicidal ideation and that's most often in people between the ages of 15 and 24, people who are much more prone to be suicidal already. It's also impairing for driving, uh, gabapentin is. Both drugs can be abused, both cannabis and gabapentin. We know from older research that approximately one in nine people who use cannabis recreationally may become dependent on it, although this is based on old figures and may not be reflective of current conditions. Physicians were told that gabapentin was not addictive, was not abusable, and this of course is not the case. There is a, a large illicit market for gabapentin, particularly in prison. It helps to make the effects of opiates more prominent. Unfortunately, it also helps to increase the rate of death associated with opiate overdose. There is a withdrawal symptom from gabapentin that is not as severe as with alcohol, but is still unpleasant, and no one should ever stop gabapentin cold turkey because of this withdrawal symptom. Cannabis has been very heavy reg heavily regulated since 1923, it was made illegal. It was made partially legal in 2001 in Canada with the advent of medical cannabis, and we had full legalization of cannabis in 2018. Gabapentin remains unrestricted in Canada, available by prescription. It does not require triplicate as opiates do or other addictive medications do. Gabapentin has been rescheduled in the United Kingdom due to epidemic of misuse. The Canadian Medical Association, the standard for Canadian physicians, holds that the evidence is insufficient to use cannabis for neuropathic pain. Uh, they are supportive of gabapentin um, and that uh, certain researchers have called them out on this, saying that they've been overly cautious about cannabis, per se. The CMA has been somewhat silent about gabapentin. Their journal, the Canadian Medical Association Journal, has articles noting the abuse, the overprescribing, and the lack of efficacy of gabapentin. But the Canadian Medical Association, at this point, has no moves to restrict physician prescribing of gabapentin. Of note, there is no Sunshine Act in Canada, so it is difficult to know who is getting paid by companies to help prescribe gabapentin. Moving on to some myths, there are a rich mythology around cannabis. The first being that it is common to have cannabis that has been contaminated with fentanyl. This has never been proved to be true. There's no confirmed samples of cannabis with fentanyl in it. Fentanyl is actually destroyed if people smoke it in a joint. It has to be smoked in a different way off aluminum foil. There's also the terms indica and sativa that are still commonly used. At one point, this re represented a difference between the two types of plants and potentially the type of effect they would have on people. However, over the last few decades, hybridization amongst these plants has rendered these distinctions meaningless and is no longer possible to look at a name, to look at a label and tell what is in that plant or what the effect it's gonna have on a person. Myths around gabapentin are, are few. Uh, there was a gentleman in the UK who was claiming that after taking gabapentin, he became gay. I haven't uh, read any research studies supporting that so far. Looking at the clinical indications for these medications, for cannabis, we have indications for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, for spasticity, for PTSD, and for chronic pain. But many people have raised concerns about cannabis being a panacea and applied to every condition out there. And we hear this especially for physicians. But just co for comparison, I'd like to read off the indications for gabapentin and what people are prescribing uh, that for. And we find that doctors are prescribing gabapentin for acute pain, chronic pain, post-operative pain, neuropathic pain. They're prescribing for tremors, seizures, and muscle cramps. 
They're prescribing for depression, mania, herpes, zoster, tardive dyskinesia, restless leg syndrome, fibromyalgia, cancer, diabetic neuropathy, interstitial cystitis, arthritis, anxiety, pancreatitis, chronic cough, occipital neuralgia, migraine, bipolar disease, drug dependency, alcoholism, alcohol withdrawal, opiate withdrawal, and benzodiazepine withdrawal. Does it work for all these things? The evidence just isn't there. It's unclear whether gabapentin works for much of anything. However, we've seen a tremendous rise of gabapentin, and that's come from large amounts of pharmaceutical money being used to promote the drug. It's being heavily uptaken because now physicians are much more concerned about prescribing opiates or restricted by their college for prescribing opiates for their patients, so they have to turn to an alternative. The fact that it may not work very well sinks to the bottom. There's a perception of safety with gabapentin that is really not true. We now know much more about its side effects and its impairment risks. There's been a tendency of physicians to say, well, if the gabapentin is working, is not working for you, that we should increase the dose. And there's been many studies showing that increasing the dose does not add to any pain relief, but only increases side effects. Nonetheless, this is a very common prescribing pattern within British Columbia. So if we look at the protocols for treating neuropathic pain, which is one of the main reasons that uh, gabapentin is around, gabapentin is certainly high up on the, the list when we look at an algorithm for managing uh, neuropathic pain that comes from the Canadian family physicians. They also include opiate analgesics and tramadol, which are terrible drugs for neuropathic pain and have significant side effects. Cannabinoids only appear as a third line agent. Unfortunately, if you look at the evidence to support gabapentin, which is the first line agent, I quote from a study here, there is moderate to high quality evidence that anticonvulsants are ineffective for the treatment of low back pain or lumbar radicular pain. There is high quality evidence that gabapentinoids have a higher risk for adverse events. So these are medications that do not work well for the indication that they are prescribed and they have significant side effects. And yet, they are among the most commonly prescribed pain medications from physicians today. So this brings us now to a state of reality, pain and evidence-based medicine. We have limited evidence-based medicine about cannabis because for many decades, we weren't allowed to do the research and we we're in a re research deficit. So we don't know how well cannabis works for many conditions. On the other hand, with gabapentin, it's been researched thoroughly. And what we're finding is that it has been well researched enough to know that it does not work for most conditions it's prescribed for. And it has significant harms. So there are many patients with chronic pain and some of them will be helped by gabapentin, but it's a very small number and certainly does not justify the number of prescriptions being written for this medication. There are very few prescriptions written for cannabis because physicians shy away from this from lack of knowledge. But it can certainly be an effective medication for patients. And if we move on to a summary from one of the gabapentin studies, it reads, even absent clinical trial, trial data, it is possible that drug X may help some patients who have clinical features of neuropathic pain. In the same way that not every patient responds to medication with proven e efficacy for their condition, there are some patients who may respond to medications even though efficacy was not demonstrated in a clinical trial. The problem is that throws out evidence-based medicine, says you shouldn't pay attention to studies. I think you should pay attention to studies, but the studies haven't been done for cannabis. With this equipoise in what we understand, certainly some patients are going to be helped by gabapentin, and it doesn't mean that it needs to go away, but it needs to be far more restricted than what it is. And physicians need to consider that cannabis with a similar side effect profile and more effect on neuropathic pain may be a more appropriate selection for these patients. And they should consider where the research comes from and the bias behind these, both of these medications. Thank you.